Uh, well, I want to thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, I didn't understand a word of it, but I was very grateful to have it. I'm also <laughs> grateful uh, to be invited to, at this amazing event. Now, I'm going to talk about the nature of human civilization, and I'm going to talk about objects that are, in a sense, constitutive of human civilization. These are objects like money, universities, governments, institutions like marriage and private property. And I want to situate the discussion in a larger intellectual context. The leading philosophical problem of the present era is how to reconcile a certain conception that we have of ourselves with what we know about how the world is from physics and chemistry. From physics and chemistry, we know that the world consists entirely of physical particles and fields of force. These are organized into systems and have complex causal relations. But our own self-conception requires that we think of ourselves as having free will, as having morality, as having art, politics, aesthetics, and ethics. The question is, how do we reconcile ourselves with our human reality with what we know of the physical reality, where the physical reality consists of mindless, meaningless physical particles? Now, there, one of the mistakes that we need to avoid is to suppose there are really two worlds, the world of the mind and the world of the body, the world of flesh and the world of espiritu. That, that's cheating. Where we live in one world and we're going to describe our reality in that one world. Okay. Now, in describing that one world, we need to make a distinction between those features of reality that exist independently of us, such as mountains, molecules, and tectonic plates, and those features of reality that are dependent on our attitudes, where we assign purposes and functions to things. Uh, so to take an obvious kind of case, I carry around in my wallet uh, these bits of paper, uh, but the bits of paper are interesting to us because out of these bits of paper we have created money. But money, unlike molecules, has an existence that is entirely observer relative. It's relative to our attitudes that it is money. So we are part of the reality that we lived in, that we live in, is a human creation, the reality of functions. Humans have the ability to assign functions to objects, and the functions only exist relative to the assignment. It's an objective fact that this is a pen, but only because we have designed and used it for that purpose. In the same way, it's an objective fact that this is valuable currency in the European Union, but again, that's only because we have created and assigned it. Philosophers like paradoxes, so I will state a paradox that forms part of the topic of my discussion. The paradox is, how can there be an objective reality of money, private property, government, marriage, universities, and summer vacations, which is objective in the sense that it's not just my opinion that it's money, and yet such a reality is created by subjective attitudes. All right, the first notion that I have introduced is the notion of the assignment of function. We have the capacity to assign functions to objects and to people. But many animals have that capacity as well. Think of birds' nests or beavers' dams. These are cases where functions are assigned to objects that don't have those functions intrinsically. But now I want to introduce a crucial notion. Human beings have a capacity that, as far as I know, no other animal has, and that is they can assign functions to other people and to objects. 
where the function is performed not in virtue of the physical structure of the person of the, or the object, but rather in virtue of a certain status which is assigned to the person or the object. And it's only in virtue of the collective acceptance of that status that the person or object can perform its function. Take obvious cases. Think of Barack Obama. Barack Obama has powers that I do not have and functions that I do not perform, but those are not intrinsic to his biology. It's not in his DNA that he is President of the United States but it's rather it is in virtue of the fact that we have assigned a status to him. The status is that he is president of the United States. And in virtue of the collective acceptance of that status, he can perform the functions of the presidency. Now this is a remarkable capacity, the capacity to impose statuses on objects that give those objects, but objects includes people here, that gives those objects powers that they would not have without the collective acceptance of that status. How does it work? I think, in fact, this is the essential trait of human civilization and how we differ from other social animals. And I'm going to explain the development of my own thinking on these matters. I'm going to explain how I evolved a certain kind of theory by seeing the weaknesses of my earlier attempts to answer this question. Okay, now, how is it going for speed? Everybody understand me? I mean, uh, okay, all right. All right, I, I, it's difficult to talk with this guy talking simultaneously, but I can't shut him up, so I just keep talking. Okay. It seemed to me for a long time the key to human civilization was a notion of an institutional fact. Now some facts don't care a damn about us, such as the fact that the Earth is, is uh, 90 million miles from the sun, but many facts are de <clears throat> dependent on our attitudes, such as that uh, such and such is money or such and such is private property. And it seemed to me those facts that once dependent on us typically existed within human institutions. Institutions like uh, football or uh, universities or governments or institutions like marriage and private property. What are those institutions? Well, I <clears throat> introduced the notion of a distinction between two kinds of rules that I call constitutive rules and regulative rules. Regulative rules serve to regulate antecedently existing forms of activity. So the rule in Italy, drive on the right-hand side of the road, does not create the possibility of driving because people can drive without that rule. But the rules of chess don't just regulate the activity of playing chess. They constitute that activity. You're only playing chess if you follow at least a sufficient number of those rules. It seemed to me the key to understanding human institutions was the existence of these rules that constitute the very behavior they regulate, and they always have the same form. It's not obvious on the surface that this is the form, but the form is always object X counts as Y in context C. X counts as Y in C. So such and such a move counts as a legal knight's move in check. Such and such a position counts as being in check. Such and such a kind of check counts as checkmate. All of these are parts, constitutive rules of the game of chess. And what goes for chess goes for other institutions like money and government. So it seemed to me that institutional reality, social objects with status functions, were created by repeated applications of rules of the form X counts as Y in C. Now you might think, well, that's too feeble. You can't create civilization with such a simple apparatus. 
But in fact, it's very powerful. It has two formal properties which distinguish it. One is it iterates upward indefinitely. So I don't just make noises, but I make noises that count as performing certain kinds of speech acts. And then performing those speech acts counts as undertaking a legal obligation. And certain legal obligations count as, for example, getting married or uh, becoming a professor. What you have in that case is you build the x terms on other y terms and so on up. So x1 counts as y1, but y1 equals x2, which counts as y2, and you go up indefinitely. Similarly, institutional structures spread out laterally. So I don't just have money, but I have money in my bank account at the Bank of America on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley, and the money is put there by my employers, and I use it to pay my taxes, credit card bills, and so on. Now, all of those are interlocking structures of human institutions. So the system is powerful, but it's a power that derives from human acceptance. However, there are certain uh, weaknesses to it, and I was, when I was aware of the weaknesses, uh, that it seemed to me I could deepen the analysis. So here goes with the next stage. First of all, sometimes you don't need an X term to impose the Y function. I, you can just create an institutional object out of thin air. Uh, so, for example, take corporations. Uh, the corporation is an ingenious human invention, the limited liability corporation, but it has no physical existence. It may have an office or a building, but that's not the corporation. The corporation is purely abstract. This is the case where we create a Y status function, but do it without imposing some status on a pre-existing object. Or take money, my favorite example. <clears throat> the temptation is to think that money is somehow essentially currency, but in fact, most of your money has no physical existence at all. I, a rather small amount of the money in the world is in the form of uh, bills and coins. Most of the money exists in the form of magnetic traces on computer disks in banks. And those aren't really money. They represent the amount of money that you have. Furthermore, another weakness of my earlier views was that language, though it's obviously the most important institution, seemed an institution like the others. So just as getting a majority of votes in the Electoral College counts as becoming President of the United States, so if I utter the sentence, snow is white, that counts as making the statement that snow is white. Language looks like just a more general institution. What I actually think is language is unlike all the other institutions. It is the basic institution, and human languages are what make us most distinct from other animals, distinct even from animals that have a form of symbolic communication. The bee language or the dolphin's language is nothing like as powerful as ours. And what I'm now going to show you is that there's a certain kind of speech act, a certain form of linguistic representation that actually enables us to create human civilization. And this is now the, the second uh, stage of my thinking on these matters. Okay, now I catch my breath and take a drink of water. See, it's the only way I can get him to be quiet is to shut up myself. Okay. Okay. Here goes. When we speak, it is an amazing and miraculous phenomenon. Noises come out of my mouth, and yet we, many people take those noises seriously. The University of California even pays me to make noises out of my mouth in front of my students. Now, what, what sorts of things can we do by making these noises? Well, the, the phenomenon of making these noises I call performing speech acts. 
And it turns out there are rather limited number of things you can do with speech acts, rather limited number of kinds of speech acts you can perform. The philosopher's favorite speech act is the statement or the assertion, uh, such as snow is white or two plus two equals four or Italy is a republic. And those are cases where we try to make the words fit the reality. The utterance has the word-to-world direction of fit, and if it fits, we say that it's true. But not all utterances are like that. Orders and commands and promises and vows are not supposed to describe an independently existing reality. They are supposed to enable us to create a new reality, a new form of reality. So they have the world-to-word direction of fit, the world is supposed to change to match the words. So we have at least three kinds of speech acts. We have assertives that can be true or false and have the word-to-world direction of fit. The words are supposed to match the world. And the simplest test for whether or not a speech act has that direction of fit is can you literally say that it's true or false? But two other kinds of speech acts are directives that include orders and commands and requests, and commissives that include promises, vows, and pledges. They do not have the word-to-world, but rather have the world-to-word direction of fit. So we've got three classes. We've got assertives, directives, and commissives. And there's another class where we just express our feelings and attitudes, apologizing, thanking, congratulating, and there we don't, we take the fit for granted. If I apologize for stepping on your foot, then I just take it for granted that I have stepped on your foot. So we've got four classes of speech acts now, assertives, directives, commissives, and expressives. But now there is a fifth class that I think is unique to human beings. And that is the class where we change reality by representing it as being changed. And those, unlike the others, have both directions of fit simultaneously. Let me give you some examples. This class I call declaratives or declarations because their aim is to change reality by declaring it to be changed. And the Perhaps the most famous examples of these were Austin's so-called performatives, where you make something the case by declaring it to be the case. You make the meeting adjourned by saying the meeting is adjourned. Or you apologize by saying I apologize. Or you declare war by saying we hereby declare war. All of these are cases where you make something the case to match the speech act. Thus, you achieve the world-to-word direction of fit, but you make it the case by representing it as being the case. When you adjourn the meeting or declare war or pronounce somebody husband and wife by the use of a performative verb, you change reality. You achieve a world-to-word direction of fit, but you achieve that reality by declaring it to be changed by way of the word-to-world direction of fit. Such speech acts have both directions of fit simultaneously. So if you declare war, you, or you give away your property, I hereby give you my watch. All of those cases are cases where you change the world, but you change it by declaring it to be so changed. Now that's an amazing phenomenon, and as far as I know, only human languages have this capacity. I don't know of any other animal language that can perform these declarations. Now I want to advance what is really the main claim of this lecture. And that is, all of the social objects of the kind we have been considering, all of the institutional facts of the kind we have been considering are created by the same kind of speech act. They're created by representations that have the logical form of declarations. All status functions 
whether it's summer vacations, cocktail parties, husband and wife, uh, uh, president of Italy, I, or a 50 euro note, all of those are created by representations that have the logical form of a declaration. And because they're all status functions, I will call them status function declarations. Okay, let me repeat just to summarize. It's a complex lecture, so let me summarize where we are. What distinguishes human institutional reality from other forms of animal social organization are status functions, where the function is performed not in virtue of physical structure, but in virtue of the collective acceptance or recognition of a status. And all status functions are created by the same type of speech act. They're created by representations that have the form of a declaration. Notice the distinction. Animals have alpha males and alpha females. They have power structures within the tribe, but they do not have presidents and prime ministers. Uh, they don't have husbands and wives. They don't have owners of property. Now that's all an extension of human reality, the creation of human social objects. And all of those distinctly human social objects are status functions, and they're all created by the same type of speech act, by status function declarations. Now, I said that the uh, famous cases of status function declarations were performative utterances, but you do not need to use a performative verb to have a status function declaration. On American money, it says, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Now, I am an epistemologist. When I read that, I want to know, how do they know that it's legal tender? Have they really done a study to find out if it's legal tender, that if people really accept it as money? And the answer, of course, is they're not describing it. They're making it the case that it's money. They're, it is money by declaration. They have made it the case. Uh, and so on when we say that uh, this is the President of the United States or this is the United States of America, we are making something the case by representing it as being the case. Okay, so that's the fundamental idea that I want to get across in this lecture. All of human civilization, the ways we differ from other animals are created by a certain type of linguistic representation, the status function declaration, and that's the case where we make something the case by declaring it to be the case. Now that naturally invites the question, why do we do it? What's the point of doing this? And there the answer is, it creates power. All of the institutional facts that I've been talking about, facts about being a professor or a student, a husband and a wife, or the United States of America or the United Nations, all of those are systems of power relations. But now we get another odd oddity about human beings. The power relations in question, the power relations that are created by status function declarations are a peculiar kind of power, and that has a special vocabulary in English and other European languages for describing it. The power in question is a matter of obligations, rights, duties, authorizations, permissions, and various sorts of binding reasons for action. And just to have a label, I call all of these deontic powers. So we get a set, the following set of equations. All human institutional reality consists of status functions. Status functions without exception are created by status function declarations, by representations that have this peculiar role of status function declarations. And the point of doing that in every case, the point of creating status functions is to create power. 
But the power in question is a peculiar kind of power because it is what I call deontic power, rights, duties, obligations, etc. Now, what's the, how do these work? What's the form in which the deontic powers actually enter into our life? And there it seems to me the peculiarity of the creation of deontic powers is that they lock into human rationality. They lock into human rationality in the following way. If I recognize a deontic power, then I recognize I have a reason for doing something which is independent of what inclinations I might otherwise have. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, a nice person invites me to Modena, and I accept the invitation. Yeah, but on the day in question, oh, who wants to go to the airport? Who wants to suffer jet lag? And who wants to stand in line and eat airplane food and all of that? But all the same, I have a reason for doing it. I promised to do it, and that reason for doing it gives me a reason which is independent of my inclinations otherwise. I don't have to ask myself, do I feel like going to Modena today? Wouldn't I just rather go to San Francisco and go to a bar? I have a reason for doing it which is independent of my inclinations. And this again, I think, is unique to humans as a species, is that we can create these structures of reasons. We can create structures of rights, duties, and obligations where those function in human rationality in ways that are independent of inclinations that we might have otherwise. I'm going to try it with this okay. thing on. All right, let's see now. Well, he's, he still sounds pretty bad, but anyway, I'll see what it's like. Okay, so I now have the following set of equations as a description of human reality. All human institutional objects, institutional facts, are status functions. All status functions are created by status function declarations. All status functions create deontic powers, and deontic powers, again, without exception, provide us with desire-independent reasons for action. They lock into human rationality. And this, I am arguing, is the glue that holds human civilization together. If we are bound together in, in an incredibly complex set of relations of invisible status functions. Everybody in this room is locked into such things as families, marriage, government, uh, taxation situations, and professions. You are a professor or a student, a husband or a father, a son or a daughter. Uh, you're a member of such and such political party or such and such a club, and all of those are status functions, and they all create deontic powers. They all give you desire-independent reasons for acting. Now I want to extend this another step. I want to say not only is all human civilization created by status function declarations, but it is maintained in its existence by repeated representations that have the logical form of status function declarations. This is why all revolutionary movements try to get control of the vocabulary. In order to alter the system of status functions, you must alter the vocabulary because it is the vocabulary that creates the status functions in the first place. Look at revolutionary movements. When uh, the Bolsheviks came in power in Russia, they were anxious that the traditional forms of address should be abolished and that everybody should be addressed as comrade. Uh, this was supposed to be a way of destroying the czarist system of status functions and creating a new type of Bolshevik state, a new type of communist man. Similarly, in the United States, uh, the feminist movement in the early days was anxious to get rid of the vocabulary of ladies and gentlemen because ladies and gentlemen marked a system of status functions that they were anxious to reject. It's not obvious 
that every time we use the word such, we say things like, well, he's the president of the United States, or please meet my friend who's a professor. All of those are reinforcing pre-existing systems of status functions. And another way to see this is to see how certain words become obsolete. Um, in American laws, uh, the word spinster sometimes occurs. I have no idea if you would translate it into Italian. But the word spinster occurs, and it marked a certain type of status function. The, the unmarried woman had a certain status in the community, and this was recognized in the law. Nowadays, nobody uses that word. I, I asked my class, how many of you are spinsters? And one middle-aged woman had the courage to raise her hand. I admired her courage. But uh, it's just a word that has become obsolete. And I think uh, with changes in sexual practices, I think words like bachelor may become obsolete as well. So we are not only locked into, we're swimming in a sea of invisible status functions, but the status functions are created by words. They are created by the use of vocabularies they don't just describe pre-existing power relations, but they create the very power relations, power relations that they describe, and they create those power relations by describing them. All right, but now we have an interesting paradox, and the paradox is this. All of human institutional reality, property, money, marriage, government, uh, summer vacations, cocktail parties, universities, uh, uh, divorces, all of these are status functions created by language. But what about language itself? Language itself is not created by language. So there's a massive asymmetry between language and other institutions. Language is not just the most important social institution, but it is the one that enables all of the others to exist. If an anthropologist came back from the Amazon basin and said uh, she had found a tribe uh, that had a language, but they did not have private property or government or money, uh, that would make sense. But if she came back and said, well, they found a tribe that has uh, money and government and private property and marriage, but no language, we know something's wrong. Now, but now we can say exactly what's wrong. All of the other institutions presuppose language because they presuppose that representations create the status functions that constitute the institutions. But of course, language itself does not presuppose language. Language itself is simply the matter of imposing meaning on entities that are not intrinsically meaningful, imposing intentionality, meanings on words and sentences that are not intrinsically meaningful, where they only have the meaning that we have imposed on them. Now, I, I cannot give you an entire lecture about language, but I want just to say this much. Language is unique among human institutions in that language does indeed, within its, own, within its own area, have deontic powers. If I make a statement, I am obligated in various ways, obligated to speak the truth, obligated uh, to have reasons for making my statement. But all the same, there is a huge asymmetry. We use semantics to create deontic powers that are not linguistic, where the powers created go beyond the semantics. So we make Barack Obama president of the United States by representing him as being president of the United States. And that's a semantic content. But the powers that he have go beyond semantic powers. So there is a, a huge difference between the fact that if I understand English, I can use the sentence, snow is white, to make the statement that snow is white, and the fact that when Barack Obama was sworn in as President of the United States, the Chief Justice declares him to be President of the United States. He announces that he is now, he takes the oath of office that constitutes his becoming President of the United States. In both cases you have a semantics, 
but the powers of the sentence, Snow is white, are quite different from the powers of the presidency. Both of them are constituted linguistically, but the powers of non-linguistic institutional reality go beyond semantic powers. We use semantics to create a set of powers that go beyond semantics. So language is not, not only the most important social institution, but it's the one that underlies all of the other social institutions because the other social institutions only function as what they are because we represent them as what they are. By representing this reality, we create a new reality. We create a reality of status functions and deontic powers. Now, the <clears throat> account that I've given you, uh, then it seems to me, expands into other areas. And I'll just mention a couple of these before I stop. Uh, if you take the notion of human rights, uh, in the United States, we, th we, t we seem to think that human rights, uh, having a human rights like having a thumb, is just something you're born with it. But in fact, human rights are human creations. They are status functions. Uh, so uh, just as there are rights of the professor and rights of the student, rights of the husband and the, uh, and the uh, wife, uh, yes, somebody in, in Europe got the brilliant idea that you could have rights just in virtue of being a human being, that being a human being was itself a Y status function, and that Y status function carried with it an inventory of human rights. That's an ingenious discovery, and it has proved to be immensely powerful. But you don't discover that people have human rights in a way that they have noses. Rather, you discover that they have human rights because you find that you have reasons for giving them a new status function, for assigning them a status with a set of deontic powers where the deontic powers goes beyond uh, their sheer physical powers. Now, often, of course, we create status functions on the basis of physical powers. So it's because I'm able to drive a car physically that I am awarded a California driver's license. And it's because uh, the elevator is able uh, to function in virtue of its physical structure that it is certified by the authorities to be a safe, qualified elevator. So you get a, 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 a mixture of the institutional and the brute. You get an institution, a, a mixture of brute powers, whereas we want those powers to be certified or authorized, and we have the systems of de creation, creating deontic rights, the right to practice the law, or the right uh, to drive a car, where those powers are assigned to you in virtue of your satisfying a physical structure. Again, it's a case of X counts as Y in context C, but there we use the sheer physics, the physical ability, in order to assign the Y status function. Now, what I said about human rights, I think, applies to government generally. It's tempting to think that governments rely solely on physical force, but we found out in the Arab Spring last year that the physical force is not enough. Once a government has nothing except physical force, it is in most cases doomed. It'll be interesting to see how it turns out in Syria, but in the other uh, countries where there was an uprising, where there were uprisings last year, those were cases where the system of status functions had become intolerable, where the legitimation no longer served and as a result, the, uh, the hierarchy, the, the deontic powers collapsed. Governments require recognition or acceptance, and this is true even in totalitarian societies. The most stunning change of the past hundred years, a, a most amazing phenomenon, was the collapse of the communist empire in Annis Mirabilis 1989 and, and the subsequent years. And that is a case where simply the structure of acceptance was undermined. Now, I don't want to give you the idea that that was simple. I, we don't understand it to this day. What role did Gorbachev have in the destruction of the Soviet Union, for example? But clearly, when the elites were no longer able, no longer willing to accept the systems of status functions, 
and when the general public was no longer willing to tolerate the continued corruption of the system, it slowly unraveled and eventually collapsed. So there are two suggestions I'm making about how the ideas that I've given you can be extended. And those are the notion of human rights and the notion of political power, both of, me, both of which seem to me um, remarkable cases of state functions. Okay, now I'm going to summarize what I said because I want to leave plenty of time for questions. We start with the idea that humans are social animals along with other social animals. We discover, though, that they have structures that other animals do not have. Uh, they have human institutions in a way that other animals don't have that. Other animals have power relations. They have alpha males and alpha females, but they don't have money, government, income taxes, or property rights. What are those and how do they exist? I suggested there is a general form by which those are created. We create, we count something as having a status, and with that status, a function that can only be performed in virtue of the collective acceptance of that status. Those are what I call status functions. All of those take the same logical structure, but if we ask ourselves, well, what kind of a speech act is it where we count something as having a status that it doesn't have intrinsically, and the answer is it's a declaration. These are declarational speech acts that have both directions of fit. The purpose of doing that is to create powers, but the powers are complex. They're both negative and positive. I mean, the president has a positive power uh, to veto legislations, and he has a negative power, an obligation, that's a negative power, to give a State of the Union message. So he has a complex system of these deontic powers, and the deontic powers function in human society because they give people reasons for action that are independent of their immediate inclinations. And I then at the end suggested that there are two uh, applications of these ideas that I think follow naturally. And one is the notion of human rights. Human rights are best understood as a form of status function where we assign power to people, where we treat being a human as the Y term in the X counts as Y in C. And also political power. Political power differs from military power or police power, though of course there are complex overlapping relations. But political power differs from military and police power because it is a system of status functions, and if it's to function properly, it requires at least some degree of acceptance. I am uh, confident that this method of analysis will prove fruitful in further investigations. And in this lecture, I've just tried to give you the bare structure of how to understand human civilization in a way that does not postulate that we live in two different realms, a spiritual realm and a physical realm. We live in one realm, and in that realm, we use language to create human society. Thank you. Thank you.